What is going on guys? Welcome back to another episode of Ryan Myers Expeditions. We got Justin Lee with us today. What are we doing? We got a brown truck today. I know it looks, you know, you guys are confused because he's got a silver Tundra, but we got a brown truck. Today. So the way it works with Justin is he's always like, yo, what are you doing tomorrow? Like, you want to go dive? And I'm like, yeah. And he's like, cool, we just got to do like one small chore first. And that small chore was literally doing a lap around the island because he's trying to drop his other truck off at the shop, whatever. But regardless, that got me and him into a really freaking cool spot. When was the last time you dove right here? Right here? Bro, before I was married. I've been married for seven years. Guys, this is going to be special. We got a really cool weather pattern going on right now. This week actually is all going to be fantastic. They, it is the crack of like one o'clock. We started this expedition at what? 6 a.m. this morning? It's 1.35 p.m. 1.35 p.m. We are three hours away from my house. <laughs> we did a, we had a full day invested in this already, but guys, the water looks beautiful. It looks flat. It looks clear. It looks fishy. Dare I say it looks fishy out there, but we're going to jump in. We're going to do what we always do. Primary targets, moose, Ukus. We are Collies. Collies. We are Vecu looking Vecuulas. We, we, we got special fish here. No, we, 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 don't, we don't know <laughs> what we're gonna see here. Well guys, we are all suited up. We kind of worked out a plan. We're like if the current's going this way, we're gonna drift that way and get out. If the current's going that way, we're gonna drift that way and get out. We got a couple exit points. Not enough to do but get in the water. I have my rubber Scots. So I'm gonna have slippers. He's got these leather fancy slippers. I got my fancy wedding wedding slippers, so I guess I'm gonna- putting that in the buoy. <laughs> well, we might have a long walk back, guys, because this zone is known to have some serious currents. So we could we could be a couple mile walk going back, but nothing left to do. We're gonna see you guys out there in the water. So right away, we dive in these really cool zones. You never know what you're gonna see. And daytime lobster is just something we don't have a lot of out here in Hawaii. They tend to really, really hide. And not like Florida kind, where like you can kind of see them and their antennas are out. These things are buried. So to see them like this, where they're, they're exposed, I mean, you can see this without going, you know, 30 feet into a cave, means that you're in a pretty special area. So we found a whole cave of these things and I was like, Justin, let's see it, make it happen. Because grabbing them during the day is extremely difficult, usually. Usually they're either out walking around like complete idiots, big giant males, or they're back up in these holes. And when they're back up in these holes, they're near impossible to grab during the day. So Justin goes down there real nice and, and chill, looking in the different holes, searching for one of those bigger ones or one of those big males. He's able to identify the male versus female just by looking at him without flipping over that tail, usually. So he grabs this one and check this out. Sure, underneath that hole, there's a bunch of them, huh? Whole bunch of lobsters, but the one he grabbed was a big female. So out here in Hawaii, we don't keep the females. So that one went back. It's really important to follow whatever local regulations you have and you're part of the world or the state or whatever. And, you know, in Florida, we keep males and females. Out here in Hawaii, females are protected all the time. So, that's what we do. And they're kind of hard to identify at the very beginning. It took me a few years before I could like really accurately identify them, but they are pretty easy. And I'll grab this one and I'll flip it over and you can tell by its swimmerette. So either they got like a bushy swimmerette and they're a girl, or they have like a single set of like swimmerettes, which are like the little flaps below their tails. And, uh, and it's important to identify and figure it out because you definitely only want to take what what is legal and you don't want to shoot them because you can't tell you can see that one it was it wasn't a good shot of it but that was a female both females right there so there's a giant one in there male really but there is a huge eel in there <laughs> oh my god <laughs> no bueno we're just poking out. <laughs> <laughs> All right, enough deal with the lobsters. We're gonna keep swimming out, see what we find. 
And that decision there is kind of where our day went wrong because in this particular area, there was a ton of life in that 40, 50 foot range. And we swam right over it and we don't like hunting there. I don't like hunting there at all. It's, it's weird buoyancy wise. You can deal with the surge a little bit. You don't get fully relaxed. You don't get all of those things that I like to go spearfishing for. So we swam over all that fish, all those lobster or whatever we saw out into the hundred foot area that we do like to really dive. And the fish just weren't there. There was some stuff around, you'll see here, I get down to the bottom, there's that one little like hard ledge in the midst of all this dead corally stuff. And that's what I'm looking for. I'm looking for any kind of change. So I lay on the deep side of that ledge always. I do a little scratching, do a little grunting, try and get this uku to come up over to me. You can see there's that moo out there. There's a big whip tail uku out there cruising the other direction. Just, just there's some stuff going on. But this uku doesn't really want to play. And I'll take a long shot here at it and completely screw it up. So anytime I'm out here diving with Justin, we're rotating back and forth. So he did his dive. I don't have the footage because I'm sure he forgot his GoPro camera yet again, but he did a dive and then I do a dive. So now it's my turn again. And we stayed right on that same ledge because there was fish. We, he came up and I believe he was trying to shoot this big moo and he was like, there's a nice moo down there. So now it's my turn. And you can see again, that tiny little ledge, this tiny edge of the reef is all it takes to be a good spot, to hold a couple of these fish. That's what you're always looking for is any change. So that reef kind of like petered on the whole way. It was like, you know, that, that 40 to 60 to 90 live coral, just a real slow decline in depth. And then that one little two foot ledge, three foot ledge of hard rock, that's what we like. You can see those Moana Collies right there, it's holding that I'm looking for the moo. So you'll see right here, this is standard moo technique. I do my dusting, I do my grunting, I decide that I want to go after the moo, so I plant my face straight down in the sand. For whatever reason, the moo freaking love it. They they don't want to see your eyes, and they'll, they'll tend to come over and get a little bit closer to you and get curious when you plant your face in the sand. And you can see him, I come up, I'm looking at him really nice and slow and gentle. Boom, there he is, comes in within range. Managed to stick him with that new heavy spear gun, stoked on that thing. A long shot for me, but still within a single wrap. I am always very reluctant to leave deep water if I don't have a reason to. If, you know, very, very rarely for me does it seem like there's less fish out in the deep than there is in the shallow. So I don't want to leave there, especially after I already did all the work to swim out there. I mean, sometimes you run into too much current or you're drifting too far or whatever, you gotta come in shallower. But for us this day, the deep water was so dismal, there was so few fish that we were forced to take a step in and come explore that really live reef that you see me diving right here. This, this live actual corals you don't see all over the island, but where you do, it's usually in a special spot like we're in today. And I've been trying to take a few more of these Roy's off the reef, and that's what I got right here, just a Roy hovering out. I think maybe I'll shoot this thing, chop it up for chum, and maybe I'll stir something up here and see what happens. So absolutely nothing came into that chummed Roy. Again, I don't know why. We're kind of in that struggle part of the phase of the day. I bought this mask this day from Tokunaga's, fresh off the shelf. 
And when I was there, I asked the nice lady behind the counter if I could borrow a lighter. And I burned it right there in the store to kind of get as much of that fog, film, whatever seems to come out of the manufacturer with. And I thought I did a pretty good job, but I did not. So all day long, I was fogging up. And for me, fog is is the nightmare. Like I cannot handle it. I cannot handle a little bit of fog. It ruins my day. I'll put some water in it to kind of clear it out and it's still absolutely terrible. So I really was struggling today, but another one of those dives, 50 feet of water, live coral. You can see all those tropical fish. Moana Kali came in, desperate, stuck this thing and was stoked on another fish. Usually to get that mass clear, I will burn it and toothpaste it. So some people like to burn it, some people like to toothpaste it, I like to do both. And sometimes it takes multiple times to get it completely like seasoned, ready to, to dive with. And it didn't happen for me this first day. So I'm struggling all day, but I know for a fact I took this mask home, I did it again, I fixed it, and I solved that problem. So it was 100% that I didn't do it well enough there in the store. So if you have a mask and it's fogging, I get out there, burn it again, toothpaste it, really work it until you solve that problem. This is another beautiful little Moana Kali. Unfortunately, hit this thing right in the lips or the face and tore them off. Justin was up next with what should have been a beautiful moo, but unfortunately got completely wrecked by a shark that I guarantee had just fed on my chummed up rod. That was nuts. He flew in. He flew. Holy sh! Oh. That sucks. Flew in out of nowhere, grabbed and hit the shaft again, which he didn't like. You didn't see him so fast earlier. We did. I did. I, I saw. I think he went and ate your Roy. Some chopped a whole Roy. <laughs> <laughs> That's a giant move, though. It's a nice boot. Yeah, man. So I saw the whole thing. I was like, holy shit, he's coming. I've never seen one bend a shaft so quick like that. That was crazy. <laughs> Son of a gun. What a day, huh? Yeah. Struggle. Well, guys, that dive right there was proof that you can be in one of the coolest spots in the world, you can have the best dive buddy that you can ask for, and you can still struggle. You know, we had, we swam out there deep today immediately, and we're looking for, you know, some of those special fish, those moose, those ukus, and there was a little bit of life out there, but we didn't quite find the deep water structure that we were looking for. You know, the shallow stuff all had had a ton of life on it. But of course, we just swam right over that out to 100 feet to look for those those special fish and didn't really find them, you know? And then as we're out there diving, I had, you know, debilitating mask fog. I bought this mask at Tokunaga's on the way up here today. And for me personally, if I have any kind of mask leak or any kind of mask fog, like like I'm ruined. Like I'd rather I'd rather dive with no fin than have, you know, a leaky mask or a foggy mask. So I was dealing with that all day. We still got a couple nice fish, but we definitely struggled. And not not every single dive that that we do, that we go on, ends up perfect. I think the biggest thing is it's not a struggle. Like we worked hard for our fish. You know, and there was there was dives where you're down 9,500 feet, waiting for 215, 220, and nothing comes in. In the, know. at the end of the world. Yeah, it, it just, sometimes it just happens like that, whether it's current, whether it's just the lack of structure, whatever it is, the fish weren't there. And uh, like you said, we'd left fish to find fish, which you never do, and we ended up finding fish again in the shallow, and a shark bent my shaft. A shark did bend his <laughs> shaft. Like that was some of the wildest shark encounter I've ever seen. He shoots this moo and my dumbass chummed a Roy because nothing was going on. I was trying to stir up the ocean a little bit and I guarantee that shark came in, ate that Roy behind us, downstream of us, wherever we, you know, and then we swam away, ate the Roy, we didn't see the shark. 
Justin goes down, shoots a beautiful moo, a big moo, and it got wrecked. And we were both watching it, and I was like, oh, that, I don't think I got it on film, but he was, it got wrecked. And then he pulled it up, and his shaft was like full bent, like like full seven and a half mil shaft, just just totally bent from no pressure from you fighting the shark. Like it bent from the shark biting the shaft. It was it was pretty wild to see. I feel like a lot of times video in general shows you guys that we just swim out there and shoot a nuku, and we do that every time. But it's definitely not like that. Like there's a lot of these dives that we go out there and like. We came to the end of the world. We drove all day. This is a full day expedition. I shot one Moana Kali, shot one medium sized Moo, you know? So it's it's kind of unrealistic a lot of times what we do show you guys because those days that we crush it are what makes the best video and that's what ends up getting edited and turned into a, into a video for you guys to watch and fewer of the days that we go out there and fail end up on YouTube. Something for you guys to all think about out there as you as you do your own dives and don't necessarily swim out every day and shoot an uku, that's perfectly fine and me and Justin are doing the same thing a lot of times. But we do have dinner and we're gonna take this back to Samogram right now. We're gonna see what we're gonna cook up, what we're gonna make out of it. We'll see you guys back over there. The plan is Sam wants to make a crispy fish skin ramen soup. So she's been making a couple ramens and they're absolutely like unbelievable, but we always wanted to try it with a crispy fish skin fish. So we saw the crispy fish skin on the Daniel Mann YouTube channel. He taught us kind of how to make that crispy fish skin. So that's the first step. We're gonna fillet it and then we're gonna make that skin crispy to put in with all our other ramen ingredients. Sam's gonna actually use the frame here to make that broth. So I got the fillets off, and we're gonna start working with them, but we're gonna get this broth in the pot to begin doing its broth making thing. My next step is to get them nice and clean and beautiful. I like to trim out that middle section, that rib, that center line, blood line, whatever, not that these have much blood in them. Get a nice beautiful chunk like that. Okay, so according to Daniel Mann, the key to the crispy fish skin is to get it super, super dry. And one of the ways that he does that is he uses some salt on the skin. And then he lets it like chill in the fridge for like 20 minutes and pull some of the moisture out. So for my broth, I made all my toppings and I trimmed off like the pieces of ginger and the ends of the green onion. And I just threw in like those trash veggies in with the fish. And that'll cook and simmer for, I don't know, half an hour, an hour, until we're ready with the fillets and stuff to start really cooking. Come here. Do you guys want some fish? One sashimi plate for Samogram. One for the cats. Come here, come here, get off the table. Get in there. No? What are you doing? Samogram, uku sashimi. Look at that rainbow. Oh, it's good. It's good. A little bit of uku sashimi to go with our moo. Cats enjoy it. Okay, so I got them out of the fridge, and according to Daniel Mann, they, the salt like pulls all this liquid out. Here, check this out, see this liquid? So all that like liquidy, juicy stuff right there, we wanna get that off. So we said in the same direction of the scales, pull that off. And that, once you get it nice and dry, that is how you get crispy fish skin. Then, he said to prevent the buckling, you want to cut it. Something like that. And then I believe he said to let it chill for a little bit so it like comes back to room temperature so that it cooks even. I don't know, I'm not a professional chef like him, but that's the plan. Just a little bit of salt. 
Can't hurt. Sizzle! She, he's at the press. Rock and strained. So when it lifts easily. Wow. Not that crispy though, huh? I mean, it could it could use another minute. Keep keep her going. Oh, that's crispy. That's a crispy one. Wow, it really tightened all the way up. Oh, it's crispy though. Ow, ow. Well, guys. The skin shrunk down to nothing. Scrape it. That's the test. You, it's not crispy. Uh, it's not crispy though. This is not. This is not the Daniel Man method. We screwed up. So it came out perfect the first time we did it with Moana Kali. So we did this once before with Moana Kali. We did like the crispy fish skin something, and it was fantastic. And it was clearly crispy. For whatever reason, less crispy. But delicious? It's delicious. You're not supposed to eat it. <laughs> this is for miso. I love it. Okay, I try one. Pretty damn good. What are you doing here? I'm crisping up some ginger. Crispy ginger that's then gonna go on one of our one of our toppings, huh? Yep. The miso? Caramelized miso. Caramelized miso with the smell? What do you got going on? Is this now you're brothing? Yep, we're brothing. Brothing miso? Oh my god. I wish you guys could smell that. This is that same pan that you cooked the fish, the garlic, and now you're making the miso broth. Yeah. So it's got all that flavor from the fish, oils, and the ginger being cooked. Get all that fat. Fish fat. That miso soup. Ramen soup? Miso soup? Ramen soup. Some miso ramen. Some miso ramen. We got some bok choy that's already cooked. Pre-cooked bok choy? Yep. Oh my god. Oh my god, I want it. Soft boiled egg. Oh my god. Oh my god. Are you really my wife? There you go. Sam That's Graham. for you. I don't even care how it tastes. That looks incredible. Enjoy. Cannot move the cat. You okay? One food coma. We're right behind you. She doesn't even know what's going on. Samagram, you've outdone yourself. Yes, as Tell me. usual. I love this broth. The first time I made it, it's just, I love all the fish bones. There's so much like nutrient goodness in it. I didn't know what I was missing until I tried this for the first time. Mmm. Mmm. Wow. How's the broth? The broth is perfect, as usual. The fish is pretty good. The first time we did it, we got it really crispy. We might have skipped a few steps, but... We're gonna have to consult Daniel Mann's video. It definitely has a lot of flavor. I mean, moo is a really delicious fish to begin with. So crispy, not crispy, it's still perfect. We need real ramen spoons. I just want the broth. We make this kind of a lot. Careful. The broth really is where it's at. Absolutely incredible. We definitely need to work on that fish skin. It's like, it doesn't like peel. Oh, oh, I'm in a mess. Incredible, incredible, incredible way to use a moo or whatever. I mean, I guess we're definitely gonna have to go try this with a couple more fish. Maybe the uku ramen is coming up next. Regardless, we're gonna feast on this and clean up my mess. Guys, thank you so much for watching. Buy some merch. 
it will not be made again. This shirt is gone. You can't buy one of these, so get them while they're hot. Subscribe if you're not already, and we'll see you next time right here on Ryan Myers Expeditions.